All right, so this is like day three for the cameraman, but it is certainly not day three for Tom on this basement project. So I am catching up to him, and as usual, that rascal has gone off and done more work that I wasn't here to film, but we're going to catch up to some of that today. So I ran into him in a garage, and uh, then we came down here and talked through some of this. And uh, he's back up in the garage right now, making more cuts on more boards. So he just put up this additional wall here. The last time we visited, he, he put the one up that framed around the window. And now he's put up one on either side. And you can see where, where those break up at the top there, where they're each a separate frame. So he's got one here, and he's got one down here. Now, this one down here, we talked about this stuff just moments ago. And he's got this special little, little box thing. It's made out of three two-by-fours. You got one here, one here, and then one over here. And they're screwed together or nailed together, actually. And then the, you can see where they're, they're up, they get assembled up into the top here of this interior frame. And the reason for putting this in here is that another wall is going to come off of here, going off in that direction, you know, kind of out here somewhere. And that, building that box to the inside of this framed member that has the 16-inch stud dimension is how he's going to be able to attach that wall and it makes life easier when it comes time to put up the, the wall board and all that. So I was asking, okay, well, I'm pretty sure there's going to be another wall over here coming off of here. Where's this little box? And I'm going to be honest with you. At the moment, Tom knows exactly what he's doing and what he will be doing when he gets around to that. But I was not able with my feeble brain to get the entire drift of what the differences are between doing things like that over there and not not yet anyway not yet anyway doing it over here so that's just a detail we're going to catch up to in real time when it comes time for for Tom to be framing this part out over here and remember this kind of goes along with Tom's philosophy at this point that you can lay out an exacting plan if you want to only to find out that when you really start cutting lumber and, and nailing it to the floors that that uh, you know you had to make revisions to it so as long as you have the generalized idea which Tom does and again remember he's done a dozen of these basements you know you can improvise along the way the things that he knows with 100 percent certainty that he was going to have a frame around that window and frame along that at least up to this part of the wall and he's going to be building a frame today that we're going to watch him build that's going to be the next one that goes alongside here and goes on that wall so we'll get to see all that done and he's going to put one of those three box sections in there as well for that so uh, by the way all the rest of these now he, he got his uh, permission slip i guess from the permit people They've all been nailed into the floor with the, with his uh, uh, basically a, a, bl a ballistic gun that fires those nails into the concrete, and they're all screwed up at the top. You can see that now. This board is screwed. You can see the screws to that top board, which has been glued to the ivy using liquid nails. So this this whole section down here now is all solid and I won't use the word finished but it's complete to this point and, and screwed and nailed in place. Hello Tom. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I mean we did just talk 10 minutes ago but I'm trying to make it look like you know like, <laughs> like it's got, right. I like, just got here. Yeah you just got here. I just got here. 
So he's uh, he had to cut some boards down to precisely eight feet in length, right? Somewhere a little I, long. I mean, if I could make them a little shorter, it doesn't really make a difference because it's not going to go all the way to the wall anyway. But uh, the key is be the exact same length. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what's key here. Is and remember, this one on the bottom, all the wood in the bottom has to be pressure treated. Correct. By coat. By coat. So does that mean that the, were these also a little wider than, than your 2 by 4 width that had to be shaved down? They are, and I think it's just because they put the, the, the solution in them. It kind of yeah. swells them up a little bit. Swells so, them up, yeah. So they end up being a little bit bigger. But, um, you know, this, this doesn't make any difference. Where it makes a difference is in the middle because we're using both sides. Oh, right. Here, I don't care what it is on the outside. It can be off right. okay. half an inch. doesn't so make any difference. You only care that this surface of this board is flush with that surface down there. Exactly. And so in the back, I'm not sure it shows up here, but maybe maybe that one sticks out a little proud. There's who a cares? little bit of a difference. Yeah, who cares? I mean, you can tell when you set the boards down, they're right. not exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, okay. Gotcha. All right. All right. So I'll try to keep out of your way. All right. Well, well first thing I do is uh, just start marking things. Uh, I think I'll find my pencil, which is not always easy. Probably in your pocket. No. Behind your ear. No. <laughs> Probably upstairs. All right. That's the most likely place. I will catch up to you right then when you're ready something. to mark. All right. Let me start her up. Ready? All right. Tom found his pencil. All right, so I'm building this eight foot section, and it may end up being a little bit less than eight feet. Um, I build it on the floor, and then put it up, stand it up. Um, each section I've been doing is eight foot exactly. And the studs are eight inches in to the center, okay? So seven and a quarter from the end of the board. And if you keep that same um, measurement every time, you can build them you don't have to measure them because, you know, they're eight inches in to the center, so you can just go from there. Now, I, will, of course, will always measure from the last stud. If the last stud is right, then I want these to be right, too, and they will fall. So the way to do that is just to put your board up where it's going to go. Mark from here. It'll be 16 and 3 quarter inches. Oh, I'm sorry, 15 and one quarter inches. Okay, so from center to center, oops, 16 and three quarters, as I said. Okay, so from center to center, comes out at 16. Okay. Okay. So make, probably check it down here if you want. Make sure it's 16. All right. Once you've got one mark on, the others just follow 16 inches apart. And there you're able to use those clever little red markings on your tape, right? Exactly. You told me ahead of time where these studs are supposed to go once I find one of them. Okay. So measuring and marking. Now, are you going to use the two-line mark for each stud, or one line for the center, or how do you how are you doing the that? Center. Just the center. The center of the studs are 16 inches apart. You can so, see. Okay. I mean, you can you can mark them in an inch and a half if you want, um, but it would be hard because then now you're trying to get it between them, and you got to mark it top and bottom. So, all the viewers, and, and I'm talking all you viewers out there that are watching this, however many that is who watched the uh, fireplace enclosure uh, will recall that up there at some point Tom actually marked two two lines for each stud. And I can't remember why you did that there and you're not doing it now. Okay. These are just standard studs on the wall. Okay. Okay. 16 inches on center. There's times in the fireplace enclosure where I was putting studs up that weren't 16 inches on center such as the sides of the um, fireplace and sides of the fireplace. So okay. If, if you mark it on center, that's fine. Then you got to add three quarters of an inch. Okay. So it comes out right. So uh, I find it marked it. Figure out the inside edges, uh -huh. mark the inside edges, and then go over an inch and a half and mark it. There you go. So the, know that it's not a center line. It's, it's a stud mark. 
very little S in there. Okay, now you know exactly what you got. Perfect. Um, some of these, like uh, when we're doing the fireplace, it doesn't apply down here. I mark it with a C. It's the center line. So you, you gotcha. try to try to write on your wood as much as you can. Gotcha. So that you got it for good. And because these are studs, they they probably need to be plumb. But if they were an eighth of an inch off center compared to dead nuts 16 inch, it wouldn't matter as much. It wouldn't matter as much. I mean, when you're screwing into them, you're trying to screw into the center. Right. You basically have three quarters of a, an inch okay. either way and still get some wood. But I mean, if. In the fireplace enclosure, things had to be more exact because something was having going to have to fit between them. Yes. Yeah. They, that was a, you know, a, a science, whereas this is yeah. more yes. you know, gotcha. artistic. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah, okay. Well, that, uh, that clarification, uh, is, I think, is useful. Um, it, it's just a matter of need and, 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 and what the, the end result would need. And, and so, yeah, I get it. A center line is perfectly fine for, for putting these studs where they need to be. Yep. Yeah, and you can see up there, same thing, a single line everywhere for the center of the studs. Beautiful. And there they all are. And, you know, if, if I wanted to get down there with micrometers, I could probably find that they're, but they're not exactly on center. But they're, while they're not perfectly on center, sometimes they are perfectly good for, for the need, which is to put up wallboard onto them after and to provide some structural rigidity. Although knowing Tom, they're probably pretty damn close to being right on nuts. But that explains the two-line versus the one-line system. Yeah, I, it, I, it's just when it, it is not the center of the stud or the center of the 16 inches on center, yep. then mark, mark it differently. Okay, important, I'm gonna mark my every 16 inches, I'm gonna transfer it over. Yep. Once, once I set these boards down and start marking, the boards can't change. In other words, this is the top, this is the top of the top, this is the bottom board, this is the bottom of the bottom. Okay. Gotcha. And start from the end that makes the biggest difference. Okay, which would be obviously matching up to the other one. Okay, use my square to line the boards up okay. together. So he just used that uh, square there to just butt the edges together so he knows they're flush with each other. Now he's going to use the same tool to transfer the center line markings that he already made on the one board to the other. And you already heard him explain that this is now a matched pair. And you see that boards are not the same height or the floor as well. The boards not being the same exact height. So as long as these things don't go wander off anywhere, you know, and again, he'll probably mark them anyway, but this matched set will live right here while he assembles the rest of the studs to them and builds them into a wall. Next thing you gotta do is tie a shoelace. Let's watch this now, see what technique you know. I'm not kidding. Tying a shoe. All right, so. Tying weird anyway, so. All right, so then he'll just separate those boards and uh, keep the order. Well, I guess he's gonna mark them though. Just to be honest, if you didn't mark the T yeah. and the P and all the, they're the not bottom. Gonna go, they're not gonna go far, so we don't need to mark them. Okay. I don't need to mark them. You don't need to mark them, okay. I mean, in, in, in one sense, since you didn't mark, put a mark on the other side of the board, we know, we know the relationship between these two boards. It's right, right. there. You could do them end-to-end -end and uh, yeah, wrong. Uh, okay, right, if right. I switch them end-to-end -end because it's still 8 inches and 16 right, inches, right. theoretically, You'd be it okay. wouldn't make any difference. But, but why take might. that chance? So you're going to try to maintain this relationship exactly as they are oriented to each other. All right. The idea like here is to laying see how place. long our studs need to be, and then measure in three spots at each end of the stud. So, in case any of you are wondering, well, wait a minute, he's got one board stacked on top of the other. How can he measure like that? Well, because he's measuring to the top of that board up there on the ceiling and it's the same measurement whether the board whether he was the boards are stacked one on top of each other if, or if he were to go nail that one to the ceiling first and then measure the gap right 
You'll know you're pretty much 89 and a quarter, maybe a little bit short. 89 and a quarter for studs. One, two, three, four, five, six that I need so far. Okay. Okay. Now, the other thing I need is... What was that dimension again? 89 what? 89 three quarters. It looked one quarter, two quarters. I'm going to measure them again. <laughs> <laughs> so I always do anyway. Yeah. I think it was 89 and one quarter, so, but I could be wrong. And that's how my brain works. I, yeah, I, I, on what happens with the floor. I say something out loud to myself and it's then it, it gets remembered differently in my foggy mental ram. I blame it on the camera. Yeah, that's about seven and a quarter. But he's Four. trying to make sure his studs... No, he's not, now that I'm thinking about it. This... Well, he's, I, I guess you're trying to make sure the studs are not lining up with these joist marks. Right? Yeah, and I'm not sure why this is. Because it appeared to be? Yeah? It appears to be. I said, I had a difference of two inches at the beginning, I thought. I mean, I'm not sure these are exactly 24 either. Oh, I don't want that one either. Never mind. The oh, one here. And the reason being, uh, this this will be the the wall for the bedroom, and the bedroom needs the heat. The need, so needs the heat and the vent. Uh, ladder. Because when you can, you'd like to put a screw up through the top board and to, into every joist. Right. There's a there's a joist right here. Right. And um, what I'm trying to do is attach it firmly. Now there are spots down here where I'm going to be just going into sheetrock. Oh yeah. Okay. But what I'll do is I'll use the walls, um, and walls at 90 degrees to hold each other. Okay. So that measurement you can see up there. 33 and 3 quarters. 32 and 3 quarters. You're thinking right now though that the first stud is going to line up right with this joist, well, right? So you're not going to be able to use that 32 joist. 32 and 3 quarters is what I'm thinking right now. Three, two, three quarters, and that's a wall. But what I was saying was, the way you're, the, the, the stud you're going to put here, right, mm -hmm. is going to come right under that joist, pretty much. It might. And in that case, you wouldn't be able to screw the top board into that joist. Other than going at an angle. Oh, okay. All right. Those are two and th two, either two and a quarter, or two and three quarters wide. Oh, all right. So the wider than a stud. Gotcha. All right. I'll make sure of this because I... another key piece. Because I was, I was thinking here that uh huh. Well, not going to be able to use that one. But what I can't see is what's up underneath the ceiling board, which is a big fat joist that's two and a half inches wide. So even with even if the stud, which is only one and a half inches wide, lines up with it, there's probably a way to reach it. Get up through that tough board and, and connect to it. Now the other end. There's going to be a wall intersecting coming from the right, and that will be seven inches off the base of the cement. And the reason being is they don't want to compress this. Right. And it's three and a half inches for the two by four, so I got it enough space to make sure it stays at whatever it is, like two and a half. About. So we'll go seven off. So right here, where he has penciled in the W and the W, that's where he's going to have a wall coming off. And that wall will form the outside of the whole master bathroom suite. Right, so what I'll do is I'll put a, a, a nailing board on here. So 
so that I'll be able to pick up the um, something to, to screw the sheetrock in. And then I'll have a, also take a board. Um, that's, that might work. That's about three and three quarters. So, and uh, mm. now I'll have to put two boards. I'll have to put a one like a stud and then one going this way to be the nailing flange for the okay. side. Because he's in, yeah, he's looking ahead and anticipating what he's going to attach his wallboard to. One's coming in, they're coming at 90 degree angles to each other. And... All right. All right, so what does a bedding person say on the height? Well, I thought I heard 89 and a quarter, but. Yeah, I remember. Measure twice, you're going to have to measure three times today. Maybe the cameraman should just shut up and then he wouldn't misremember anything. He's okay. Uh, let's go with 89 and a quarter. 89 and a quarter? 89 and a quarter. Maybe a little bit high. Heavy. But 89 and a quarter should be good. Alright, 89 and a quarter. Well, screw it. Cut one. 89 and a quarter. Bring it down. Make sure it fits. If it's too small or too large, I'll make accommodations for the other ones by trying it in the other places. Right, so I need two, three, four, five, six, nine, ten, eleven. Six of them, plus three in the middle for the wall, and two at the end. So that's eleven lengths I need. 11 2 by 4s non pressure treated each cut to 89 and a quarter if that proves to be the correct right. dimension. I'll cut one. Cut one. Come down check it out. Measure measure again. All right. I'll be back. Okay. Just so, uh, we we've, we've seen that. Not not that we don't enjoy seeing you cut, but uh All right. <laughs> I just want to Well, Tom's up there doing that. Well, the you know this caught me not being a carpenter as something I had to stop and take a second look at when he went to determine that eighty nine and a quarter measurement. I, I guess I would have. This is why I'm the dummy behind the camera, and not in, not in front of it. I would have probably measured from the top of the pressure treated board all the way to the ceiling that would have given me a measurement and then i would have subtracted the thickness of of the top board and tom because he's done 12 basements knows that that's the same thing as laying the one board on top of the other and just measuring from that top surface to the ceiling Now, I suppose that there's some potential error that could be introduced if the boards are a little bit warped relative to one another. I'm seeing a, I think I'm seeing a gap down here. Maybe, maybe not between those two boards. And one might argue, well, isn't that going to put you off by an eighth or something? I don't know. I, don't know. I, I think probably not. I mean, he's the expert. So anyway, I just thought that was quicker and more clever and more direct to do it this way, but I wouldn't have thought of that. And here he comes again. Wow, that was quick. Yeah, there was, we're not going to waste our time, us and the viewers anymore, running up and down the stairs for, for that kind of thing. I will say that if you're doing this at home, and you can cut in the same room that you're working in, to a lot more efficient. Oh, yeah. Save, save your legs. Save but, your but then you'd get less exercise, Tom, and that's why you, you look the way you do, all trim and fit and good tight fit. Ready to hit the golf course. So all that that will that fit good everywhere, that's huh? Fit very well. Excellent. Well, so there you have it. There you have it. He's okay. ready to go. Eighty nine and a quarter. You need to make them the same length as this. But I'm gonna do it ten more times. You're gonna do it ten more times. All right. Ten more times. Isn't that one eighty nine and a quarter? Whatever it is, <laughs> I have a little bit extra on it. <laughs>
Okay, we'll catch up to when he comes back. So while we're waiting for Tom to come back with his 10 cut boards, you know, I'm just wandering around continuing to look at things. So I'm noticing here, you see on this wall section that he built, all of his studs are on the 16 inch centers that he wants until you get to this post. And then, I haven't measured it, but it looks like this stud and this stud are on those 16 inch centers. Remember, this is going to be a hallway opening to the egress window. So those look like they're on 16 inch centers. But then, in order to build up this little box here and provide a, a full contact surface area for which to nail uh, the sheetrock, he added, you know, this other element here. And it's always okay to have studs closer together than your 16 inch maximum, just not more than 16 inches. So you, you see here that he's got that. And then I was looking over here at this wall section again, and starting, it looks like from here, everything is going along on 16 inch centers. And once again, he got to this support post and that looks like 16 inches to here. So again, he went and put an interior stud completing this particular framing section. And so for that instance, he's got studs closer than 16 inches. That's certainly less than 16, and so is this. And that's okay. And that way there, he, he got to build nice box frame sections in here. Nice, robust surface for his uh, wall board to attach to. Even though he's put some members in there at, the, at less than 16 inches. Hmm. He should be down soon. So Tom has returned with a couple of boards that he's cut. And he's just stuck one of them in there to make sure that uh, a couple of them he's got here, that they fit all right. But then he was showing me something about what he's calling the crown of the board. So we're going to take a closer look at that. You see, you see that the board has grain. I mean, it's a tree, it's, so it's round. Right, starts right, round. Right. Yes, yes. And they cut the side of it. So it's key to keep the, the crown facing the same way all the time. Oh, as best you can. Okay, okay. okay. Can, can you always do it? Yeah, pretty much so. Would it make a difference like that? Probably not much. Okay? But I'm going to keep them all open to the right gotcha. so that all the way down, if they move, they'll move the same direction. What you don't want is one moving in, one moving out. Then you got a bigger gap. And you're, you you're thinking if they move, they could influence the drywall. Correct. So you'd rather have them all moving together in unison, not quarreling right. and creating. Let it be a little bit curved out or a little bit curved uh -huh. in, rather than in and out, depending on oh, where yeah. you go. Okay? That's, that's a knowledge just, nugget. I'll, I match these up as best I can, and I'm going to have to move them anyway with the um, places that aren't all. I'm having made sure that they fit. I see what you're doing. So you're, you're actually putting one of these on every mark. You left the two of those things sitting on the floor. And then you'll come along and you'll position them above the mark relative to the ceiling. And then you'll try to match, you know. Just, you, you, yeah, I just okay. if it's too long, I want to know it now, not when it's up. Right. So when, it's, right. when it's up, then you got to start tearing apart. Aha. Uh -huh. right. so I'll be back with a couple more. All right. Another knowledge, more knowledge nuggets. That's what we should name our channel, Knowledge Nuggets for the DIYer. Give that some thought. So Tom has got all his boards cut. He's pretty efficient, pretty quick about it. And he's come down, and he did that same trick we observed a few seconds ago, where he lays them up on top of the board there, straight up, to make sure there's no interference with the ceiling. Now he's got them all positioned. These three right here are going to make up that little three box, like the thing we, we saw earlier over here, that's way down there on that, on that wall. 
And uh, yeah, so I, I, he's got things all laid out on the floor. I think any second now he's going to move the other boards into position, and he's going to he's going to start. Oh, he's getting prepared. Good. Check check him out. Right. Got his ear protection on. He's got his big gun. All right. See what he's doing. All right. line up. Now what noise is that making? I guess you can't hear me with his headphones on. This is probably good. That's the whole point of them. Just trying to align the edges. This has got one nail and it's game on. Got to influence them a little bit on occasion to make sure that those edges all line up and we, we don't have any problems. So it looks like he's headed down there. I could use things out, put them all in there, and it'll help with the rest of the interior nails. Just like that. He's got his three box put together. I call it a three box because it's made out of three pieces of wood and only has three sides. I have no idea what the real world of construction people call it. Don't call me out on that. Alright, close. You're getting, you're going to be nailing, right? Uh, headphones make it hard to hear. Yeah, well, there's his nail gun, so that answers my question. He's not screwing these things. The heavier together. this gets, the more you need shims. So Tom was just saying that this little three box job, because let's see if I can do this right. Three two by fours, so you get one and a half, one and a half, that's three, and then three and a half. So there's really six and a half inches. Once he secures that to the to the bottom. Are okay, you hearing wise? Oh, once yeah, I'm okay. Go, don't worry about it. Once he nails that in place, it kind of sets the perpendicularity of the whole assembly. So this is gonna that three box is gonna pull that thing right up against it. Now he can go ahead, position those boards, and let the thing do the same exact process. So he's what he's doing here with the shims is he's simply 
adjusting the front edge of the boards so that they line up with the with the one uh, the pressure boards edge so that they're flush. That's all he's that's all he's using the shims for. His basement floors are never perfect. They're poured concrete. And he doesn't know where the shims are going to have to go, whether they're going to go here or there. Or... Now here he's turning it around, but I'm sure he's maintaining the same crown direction. There's a knot in that board that's partially out. So yeah, the knot, yeah, I saw the knot. Put it yeah. on the back side. Aha! Boy, you can smell that fuel on that gun. All right. So we're going to let him have at this now that we see what he's doing. Uh -oh. So Tom was just pointing out to me, in between nailing these boards in, that, you know, you, you see him like you, like you do now. He's holding the board with his left hand, and he's got his knee up against the pressure treated board. He says, you know, when you put the first nail in, that, that's fine. But then you have to make absolutely certain when you're putting in the second and third nails that you don't allow that 2x4 to twist or spin a little bit around the first nail. They've got to be perfectly vertical. Uh, otherwise, you won't get that nice flush contact surface that you want between the two edges. The edges of the pressure-treated wood and then the edge of the 2x4. So, of course, Tom makes it look easy. And one thing you can't experience watching a video is what that feels like and how much twist you know you're trying to control. I did ask him when you when that when those nails are being driven in there like that by that fuel gun, does it actually try to push the two by four stud away from the pressure treated bottom board? Because that would seem normal, right? It's, forcing its way through the first board, and then when it makes contact with that stud, it, you know, how much strength does it require to continue to hold it against that pressure-treated board, against the nail trying to drive it away? And Tom pointed out something that, that I forgot already from the first series of tapes, which is, well, at this point in time, the nail is being driven into the softer grain of the end of the board, not into the side of the board. So it penetrates it much more easily, and, it, and it's not really an issue. It's not a problem trying to you know, prevent it from being pushed away from the board like that. So that was just a question I had, and there's your answer. So the whole thing is together now, and you saw how Tom did it how he matched his boards, transferred lines, made sure the crowns were all facing in the same direction, how he built his little three box and two box, and then, and then nailed it all in place. Now, Tom being the honest individual he is, honest Tom, we call him around these parts, wants to point something out that despite all the markings and preparations, this end of the three box is pretty much right where he wanted it. But this end, not so much. What happened there, Tom? Well, I got hey, too, too, many, too many things, <laughs> too many things <laughs> to deal with, I guess. And old age, I think, might be the other thing. But okay. In any case, if they didn't align it correctly, it makes very little difference because the sideboards are for nailing, screwing uh, sheetrock. Okay. So if it comes up short on one side, which would be this side over here, um, I would just put another board or another board up okay. towards the top. And, uh, and this, is, this is one of those examples where this is not easy to disassemble at this point in time to try to correct that. It, it, it would be very difficult. That was the only thing on when I noticed it. But still, I mean, it's two, four, six nails. Uh -huh. um, you know, if they're into knots or something like that, it just rips the boards apart. Okay. When you try to take it apart. So. All right. And, you know, that result is once I put the wall up and sheet rocket, you'll say, what mistake? Gotcha. Nobody will see that again. Nobody All will right. see that again. But in interest of full disclosure, there but you go. Just right. to show that, that amateurs do make mistakes.
Well, you're no amateur. I'm an amateur. I'm so a, therefore, if he's not an amateur, anybody can make it. Amateur. <laughs> experienced amateur. All right. All right. Good enough. So we got it stood up against the wall. And Tom knows, and this is what we just spent a few minutes doing, that from this front edge to the wall back there is supposed to be seven inches. So at the moment using his trusted mallet we've jiggered the thing into position so that both ends are pretty close to being about seven inches away from that wall now he's running around with his uh, supersized level to make sure that things are plumb remember that word from our fireplace enclosure video So if we can get those edges seven inches, you know, nailed in seven inches away from the wall like that. And everything plumbed, and we know we've got surfaces that are ready to accept the drywall. And they'll match up nicely when they meet their brothers on the other sections. And, you know, the considerations at play right now are making sure that the bottom pressure-treated piece is maintaining its seven inches away from the wall. And ultimately, that these front edges are all plumbed in this attitude, as well as this attitude. Or is this one secondary? It's kind of secondary. Secondary. I mean, you've got three quarters of an inch, an inch and a half to play with, and three quarters of an inch on oh, each sheet, oh. so. Okay. I mean, get as close as you can. All right, so that's a seven, that's on, that's pretty close, that's on. And they're plumb up and down, and they're plumb coming out pretty much until, not until we do that. And coming out is really the important one, because that's the surface the sheetrock lays up against. Okay. But if you don't get if you don't get a plum everywhere, it won't necessarily be plum anywhere. So you gotta be a little bit careful um, not to get ahead of yourself. Make sure that everything is where it needs to be, especially once you drive a nail into the cement. That's like the point of no return. <laughs> I'll bet it is. Is that what we're gonna see next? That's what we're gonna see next. Alright, so he's got yet another gun here. Now what power is this? Is this like a is this a twenty two cartridge kind twenty two caliber gun. Twenty two caliber gun. That's gonna drive these nails right through that pressure treated wood and right down into the cement. So that's why Tom just emphasized that board's gotta be where it's supposed to be. Before you pull that tool out of your holster and start firing into the cement because you you're not gonna you're not gonna influence it very much with a hammer once you do this. I've taken them out before. And it, it's virtually impossible. First thing you have to do is cut the studs because there's no way to raise it up. The other thing you can do is you can dig out the um, nails. Wow. And cut the board in the bottom. It, it just, it is wow. it's no fun to have to do that. So you want to make sure you don't have to do that at all possible. And you, you are satisfied now with that piece of... That bottom pressure treated wood is where it's supposed to be. Right. As long as nobody comes to fix that thing, I'm happy. I'm happy. All right. I'll, I'll stay clear of it. You don't have to worry about me, boss. All right. Okay. Another. Another is this a loud thing, too? This is extremely loud. Oh, extremely loud. And, and wear gloves. I mean, you should wear gloves when you're handling all the wood. You should wear gloves when you're using a gun like this. It has a pinch factor, and Ooh. it just puts marks all over you when you Ooh. pinch your skin. So. All right, I'm going to head over here and telephoto lens you. Okay, so the plan. Because I don't have ear protection today. I was too stupid to remember to bring it. Mm. 
I mean, as he says, it's a, the thing firing that nail in there is a 22 caliber a shell, basically. So I'm going to catch this. Fire in the hole. Fire in the hole. Hmm. Well, for an old rock and roller like me, who in the mid-80s was standing on a stage next to a loud drummer in clubs playing lead guitar, that wasn't bad. Far end's done. Come back to the near end and make sure that lines up. So we're at the point. This is all. This is all nailed in. 22 caliber bullets, basically, for cartridges driving those nails into concrete, through the wood and into the concrete. So now what's left is the top. And Tom's knowledge nugget here is to start on this end at the top, because that's the end that's got to be as flush as possible with the mating frame wall. So start on that end, get that one right, and I guess the other one, you want it right as well, but it can be a little more forgiving if it doesn't wind up supposedly in some ideal place. Now, what, what's going to determine this? Are you going to be using your trusty uh, uh, level, level, your level to make sure things make, are plumb? Make, make sure it's plumb both ways. Okay. Okay. We have a little t tolerance. We can go to the right if we needed to, but can't go to the left. Can't go to the left. Not without getting out your Dremel tool and shaving uh, some wood off yeah, it. Yeah, I don't think that's going to ever happen. <laughs> Just have a feeling. Okay. Not going to happen. All right. So let me uh, get the whoopsie pencil. All right, what do we need here? We need drill. Now, I, I guess I guess one one obvious question that I should ask is, sure. gee, Tom, why don't we just make sure that those two edges are flush together? Well, you, you could do that. I mean, you're, you're assuming that this board and this board are on those boards identically. Well, I, I assume that because you did the work. Well, you know, you never know. I screwed up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This this potential for error here. Gotcha. Well, again, we're dealing with wood, and it's uh, thankfully it's flexible and forgiving and easy to work with, but it's not precise. Let's see how Tom does this. Now, the last time you did something like this, I think you pre-drilled holes in the wood? I did. Okay. And I will do so again. All right. And the reason being is that if I don't pre-drill it, and I think I'm actually going to go this way now, I think. Um, if you don't pre-drill it, the... the Goes in at an angle, it kind of pushes yeah. things right or left. Okay, so I don't want this pushed th that way at all. I mean, I could probably hold it in place without any trouble, but because it's pretty tight. But you know, you kind of want to make sure that that the screw isn't going to be the one that's adjusting it. Got you to where it wants to be. And having a pilot hole done ahead of time means you can then put the screw up through that. Then fudgy coo the position of your top board before you drive it up through the white board and into the joist. Did I get that all right? You got that all right. All right. Now, what was the last thing you said? You said, uh, I think I'm going to go this way instead. What was that comment? Oh, oh, I can go this way or I can go this way. Okay, this 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 way, I think, pulls it this way. You mean the direction to... of putting the screw in? Right. If I put the screw in like that... When it gets in there, oh, pull it back. Oh, it'll anything. pull it back a little bit. I think. All right. Here, try. That big rubber influencer there. Fixer tool. Another fixer tool. I gotta get this absolutely right. I don't want to be off by a sixty-fourth, right? <laughs> Jackson, right? What's that? Oh, the gloves? I, I got one. 
Or, or O.J. Simpson, right? O.J. Simpson, if he won't go. All right, if it doesn't fit, you must have quit. So here's a pilot hole going in, I think. Yeah, got to drill the pilot hole. So even though this stud is lined up right under a joist, we know the joist itself is thicker than a 2 by 4 And by drilling in at an angle the way Tom just did, he would be able to absolutely find his way up through his 2 by 4 through the drywall, and into the meat of that joist. Just can't find his screws. <laughs> Earlier we couldn't find a pencil. Hey. We got that one conquered, right? They get losing things. By the way, do you know where your pencil is? Oh, there it is. I see right it. Right there. Aha! Uh -huh. yeah. Close proximity to me. Now a screw is going into that same hole. So to Tom's point, since it's following the hole, the hole actually provides kind of like a, a, a drill jig. And then when it, once it finds its way through the drywall. Let's go down the other end and do that. And then the middle should be easy. So what you had done was to make sure it was plumb, then you put your pilot hole in, and it looks to me like those edges are pretty darn flush. So you did a good job there. I you, did. you could have just used those edges, but you chose to be a little more scientific and data-driven. So Tom, I see where this is going, and I also see that my thing is yelling at me to put in another tape, but I think, I think we've got it by Jove. Call it a day. Yep, well, not do, for you. Do the end and then work to the middle. Work to the middle. To do that one on the end and then come through the inside like that, finding all the joists straight up where you can and not at an angle and but a bang. You have to line up the two ends. Everything else falls where it is. It's going to be where it is. You can't move it. Awesome. So. Well done, my man. Right. Thank well you, sir. done. Another fruitful and productive day with Tom Sullivan showing us how to build and re refinish a basement. So there will be more episodes to come because there's a lot more work left to be done. Thanks, Tom. Hey, guys.